you there? Have you? Hello, everyone. <laughs> Welcome. It's my pleasure today to introduce our speaker, Guillermo Solana. A native of Madrid, Guillermo Solana has been artistic director at the Museo Tizen Bornemitsa since 2005. Previously, he also served a long tenure, 20 years or over 20 years, as professor of aesthetics and art theory at the University of Universidad Autónoma de Madrid, where he received his doctorate. Dr. Solana is a noted scholar of 19th century and modern art who has lectured extensively, authored numerous books, articles, and chapters. While at the Thyssen, he's curated many important exhibitions, including exhibitions featuring the work of Paul Gauguin in 2004, Vincent van Gogh in 2007, Camille Pissarro in 2013, and last year, an exhibition featuring works by Paul Cezanne. Dr. Solano has also curated the exhibition of modern drawings from the Abello collection, which, as many of you may remember, opened here at the Meadows Museum in 2008. Currently, he's working on an exhibition project titled Renoir's Caress, Tactile Sense and Intimacy, scheduled to open in 2016. This evening, Dr. Solano will speak to us about modern works on view upstairs in our new exhibition, of the Abeo collection. Please join me in welcoming Guillermo Solana. Thank you, you all. Thank you, Carmen. Uh, thank you, Mark, for inviting me here. And my apologies for speaking in English. Uh, I mean, in my broken, tattered English, uh, be indulgent because it it cost me <laughs> an effort to to try to it is difficult when when you are um, easy in your own language when you are comfortable in your own language when you, you are a fluent speech in your own language to to become so so clumsy so primitive so uh, in another in a different language but i'll i'll try my best my my only ex excuse for for uh, speaking to you in, in my broken English is having been invited by a great friend like Mark and being tempted by the prestige, of course, of this grand museum, which is the best museum of, of Spanish art out of Spain, definitely. Uh, I don't want to offer you a kind of very scholarly and pedantic uh, explanation of the paintings in the wonderful galleries you've got there, but simply to take you to uh, for a for a short I, I I hope walk through some of the highlights of the modern part of this uh, grand exhibition of the Abeo collection. Um, even if I, there are, there are wonderful, mm, all masters things I, I would like to, to speak about, but uh, there will be an, a, a another lecture devoted to, to those uh, all masters. The, for instance, the Juan de Flandes, which I remember discovering in the, uh, the library of, uh, of Abello like 15 years ago or 20 years ago and it was uh, such a, an impression or, or the El Greco which is a real jewel uh, or the Rivera or some other pieces. So let's start if we can lower the lights please. Let's start with a um, picture of the collector at, at home, the, the, the collector's home itself, uh, with this eccentric and intriguing way of disposing the, the uh, uh, installing, arranging the paintings there uh, on the wall, combining, um, let's say, modern things, but in principle not closely related to each other at first sight. 
um, the two portraits by Goya, uh, at the sides, uh, the, the, a portrait by Juan Gris in the center, and um, the, the triptych, the small triptych by Bacon um, beneath the, the Juan Gris. Goya, Bacon, Juan Gris, plus the, the, the two studies at the sides by Zacarias González Velázquez with Godfather and Angels. Well, the, the whole reminded me of the walls of the fabulous uh, Barnes Foundation, which uh, used to be in Marion and now it's in Philadelphia, to the dismay of the <laughs> people of Marion. Um, you know, the doctor, Dr. Barnes was known by the eccentric rules he imposed on uh, the exhibiting, the public exhibiting of his collection. And this hyper symmetrical um, arrangement of the paintings, which is both hyper formalistic and, and a bit crazy in a way because it combined different, so different sorts of things. For instance, in this case, there are the, the, the wall is composed <coughs> mainly of Renoirs and Cezannes, which are not so easily uh, combined, even if the two artists were uh, friends. Um, sometimes the curators look down to, to collectors because they are not so knowledgeable or they at least they do not know how to explain with intellectual rigor their views. But I, I do think that there is some insight in the collector. There is some insight in the closeness of the art collector to his or her things in this way of combining them crazily enough. Is not there something which um, can relate Goya and Bacon to each other? They are not connected in, in an uh, obscure uh, way. Um, let us take a look at the, at the Goyas, the portraits, they are simple, sober, natural. They are, they are, you know, the the parents-in-law of Javier Goya, uh, Goya's the painter's son. Uh, five years after the wedding, the Goya had painted a series of miniature portraits uh, of the whole family of uh, the in-laws, and five years after that, he painted the the portraits of this upper middle, middle class uh, couple um, who uh, didn't suffer so much apparently from the war because Juana had grown, uh, how do you say, plumper, <laughs> uh, <laughs> even in the, in, the, in the toughest years of, of the war of, in, of independence against the the French, um, the, the, the lace in the neck is um, emphasized because they run a um, business a shop, a big shop of uh, uh, fine laces, of fine textiles. I don't know how to, to yeah, textiles, no? Um, so that, that is the only allusion to their social status or so, because on the, for, for, the, for the rest, the, the portraits are very straight, they go to the face, they, mm, they are frank, uh, particularly the, the one of Juana Galarza, which is the, the more open. Well, um, near to that, the um, three studies for a portrait of Peter Baird uh, look um, really 
awful, no? really. <laughs> Peter, Peter Beard was a um, famous photographer devoted to photographing Africa, particularly. And he got to be a, go a, a, a great friend of Francis Bacon because uh, they both were very pessimistic about human nature, very fatalistic, and they thought everything, everything was for the worst. Uh, and that, that is what Peter Beard says. Um, and it seems that Bacon was particularly attached to this triptych, this small triptych, because uh, Juan Abello has told the anecdote, the story, that in his last years, they were, the collectors were uh, closely in touch with the artist, and uh, Bacon approached them to buy the triptych back, to, to, to recover the triptych. And they, they asked him in exchange um, one of the portraits of the Pope Innocence the, the, the Tenth, which Bacon was mm, about to, to, to get when he died, and the, the deal uh, wasn't closed finally. But he was particularly attached to this triptych um, which is very representative of a certain thread in, in, in Bacon's work. You know that he created dozens of triptychs uh, along the years. First, uh, from the 40s, smaller triptychs, and then uh, since 1962, large triptychs. Uh, which were a way in which he kind of tried to go beyond easel painting, the classical uh, quadrangle, the classical of, of, the, of the canvas, uh, in search for a, a different horizon, but without getting uh, entangled in a uh, n complex narrative thing. The triptych is not necessarily a narrative. It is simply a um, multiplicity of images. In this case, for instance, it is ambiguous enough. It could be, for instance, the three ages of man, the classical topic of the three ages of man, or past, present, future. It, uh, it could be something like... Um, something inspired in the uh, photography of movement in the um, uh, beginning of the um, cinematography. Uh, Bacon uh, was famously fascinated by the, by the uh, research of Edward Mybridge on, the, uh, on capturing the movement of the animals and men. No? So it's a kind of uh, cinematic um, series. There could be many things. It could be like the predella from a, an altarpiece, taken from an altarpiece, even uh, except that the, that the topic is not the, the adequate one for that. But we, we will be back to that topic of the relationship of the triptych and the altarpiece as a function, as a way of Anyway, um, getting back to Goya and Bacon. Goya and Bacon are going to be our first and last, the, the, the extremes in our um, walk through the, through the exhibition there. No? The Goya is the door to m modernity for, for Spanish art, for Spanish painting. Bacon, in this case, is uh, uh, rien ne va plus, the, the, the last term in this, in, in this evolution. Um, but they can be connected directly one to each other. And which is, where would you remember of the disasters de la guerra, uh, pinturas negras, disparates, all the the awful, awful subject matter and the, the, 
the vi violent way, the cruel way of depicting those obscene things, things that shouldn't be shown in Goya, which is what, what Goya and Bacon could have in common. Uh, the goring, no? The, this cruelty, this uh, effusion of blood, the slaughterhouse, painting as, uh, as a slaughterhouse. Um, well, in fact, Lucas Velázquez is uh, an epigon and a successor of Goya, one of these romantic painters which in Spain um, worked over the topics extracted from, from Goya. In this case, for instance, the Tauromachia by Goya is in action and um, uh, treating the painting also with the liberty, the, the characteristic freedom of, of Goya himself. But um, the door to modernism in Spain, in Spanish painting, is not through uh, Eugenio Lucas or through Alenza, another of these Goya-esque uh, painters, not even through Mariano Fortuny, which is, was one brilliant, if, if uh, how do you say, malogrado, uh, ill-fated, uh, painted in uh, the second half of the 19th century in Spain. If we follow a French pattern, a Frenchified pattern, a French way of telling the, the story of modern art, we should uh, start, obviously, by the landscape, no? And following the pattern, uh, the way um, the, 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 the story of modern painting is, is told in French painting is starting with Barbizon and going to the Impressionist, no? Manet is uh, a, a very important figure, but it, it is not exactly fitting into that scheme. The, the patriarch of modern tradition in France during the 19th century, following, following this uh, scheme of following the story of the landscape, would be Pizarro, of course. Mm, first, maybe Corot, and then Pizarro. Well, the, the role which Pizarro played in, in France as being the the initiator, the, the, the precursor of the whole impressionistic revolution was played in Spain in a more, much more modest uh, measure and way by Aureliano de Beruete. Aureliano de Beruete is still um, not very well known painter abroad, out of Spain, not even in Spain. He, even in Spain, he has been half forgotten. I, I am planning, I, I plan to, to do a retrospective of Beruete in a couple of years from now. Maybe we, we could talk about bringing it to, to, to Dallas. Um, Beruete was uh, not just a painter, he was a doctor in law, he was a very competent writer, a collector. He was well off, he was affluent, he could buy things by his colleagues in need, uh, he could help many, many of his colleagues. Uh, he helped, he supported famously Soroya in his early steps and Soroya uh, learn a lot from Beruete and receive from Beruete uh, his whole client clientele, his clients for portraits, for instance, which was a key resource for a painting starting in the, 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 the battle of getting a name. Um, the, the, the entrance of Beruete, well, this is one of the works I love most in the in the exhibition. It's really a wonderful painting. Um, but it is 
uh, it is not a bold painting for the um, 1895. It's uh, uh, if you can think of the, the things which were happening in France for this, <laughs> at this by this time, uh, it was. The, the impressionist was something already passé. We um, uh, Van Gogh, Van Gogh had died already, and and Serra, and and it was Cezanne who made the day in, in in these years, no? Which was obviously much beyond this these formulas. The um, the construction with uh, this horizontal stripes, this kind of classical composition discipline of Beruete comes very much from straight from Corot. Huh? Uh, he was, um, he acknowledged that Beruete was very attached. He confessed to the first Corot, to the Corot of, of the 20s who work in the open air in, in Italy, in Rome particularly, uh, not to the later corot of the souvenir of these paintings from memory, vague, diffuse. No, he, he liked the naturalistic um, face of, of corot, but it with, with this classical discipline in, in it. And it's, uh, I, I think, Beruete is a very effective disciple of, of Corot in this case. E even the, the bridge is a typical motif uh, which appears in, in many paintings by Corot. Now I, I bring you something from the wonderful collection of the Meadows. Uh, um, the Blind Man of Toledo. It was it was Beruete who took for the first time Sorolla to Toledo and uh, showed to, to him the, 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 the place, the, the legenda legendary landscape of Toledo, which had been depicted famously by El Greco, for instance, the dramatic um, uh, cleavage of El Tajo, uh, all these the views from the other side of El Tajo. Um, but Please consider how there is such a gap between the, the classical serenity and the, with the, the city in the distance, with the, the church of San Juan de los Reyes um, there at the summit, and all these plains, layers, very well ordered, and these sudden uh, immersion of, of, of the beholder, of the viewer, into the space. No? The spectator in this case is like absorbed into the space and we go straight to the end of, the, of the, this, this lane, this uh, road close to the river. Um, the the uh, connecting the first, uh, um, how would you say, the first term, the first plane of the painting, and the, um, the most distant places is the ambition of, of Sorolla, and he, he does it with a boldness, with a daring that the Beruete probably could not conceive of. Uh, there was a, an influencing, influencing back of Sorolla on Beruete. Sorolla learned a lot of things from Beruete, but Beruete, I think, as a result of dealing with young, bolder painters as Sorolla, modified his approach to, to a space and to the, the handling of paint itself is quite different in this. This is the other Beruete which is in the, in the exhibition, and you can notice, you can you can see how uh, how different they they are from each other. The the first classical view from afar of the Iglesia de San Juan de los Reyes with this big sky and this uh, turbulent 
landscape of the Sierra del Guadarrama, which is like a bit of, um, it's, I think it could be called post-impressionistic. It is midway between uh, Pizarro and almost Cain Sutin. There is um, uh, a certain um, dirtiness in the handling of paint. There is a messiness in the handling of paint, which is uh, much more, much bolder than. Modernity in Spain, in painting, in art, received the name of modernismo. Modernismo is the name of uh, the equivalent of modernism in English. But modernismo in Spain was both in lit literature and in, in painting a mix of many different and very different trends. For instance, in, modern, in, in the, the modernista landscape in Spain, we've got things closer to, to European symbolism than to anything else, like the later uh, gardens by Rossignol. Rossignol was a guy who started in Paris with casas, making an um, open-air painting, uh, not exactly close to the impressionist, to the mainstream of impressionism like, say, Monet, but rather to the more moderate 